Hello, and thank you very much for joining me today to hear about and to discuss a topic which I am very passionate about. We're talking about open source and government transformation today. Now, I've been building online products and services for the last 20 years, and specifically on open source technology in the public sector over the past seven years. Now, that use of open source technology has certainly been critical to the success of those projects that I've been working on. And at this point in time, we've seen open source gain so much momentum, especially during the pandemic, because we've seen that it's really able to solve common problems by using um, these readily available elements of open source technology and it can save time and money, adapt to scale and allow you to move very quickly. Now, that's one of the reasons that, um, at AWS that we've been developing open government solutions, which is to showcase some of these examples of reuse, the fabulous work that's gone on across the public sector and uh, allows people to, from different organizations around the world to take advantage of what others have done who share similar problems. Now, today uh, we're very lucky. We're gonna be talking to um, Warren Smith from the UK Government Digital Service uh, about this perfect storm of opportunity. Um, during the conversation that you're going to hear, can I please encourage you to uh, submit your questions that you may have uh, at any point during the session. Uh, those are gonna be picked up uh, and facilitated by my colleague Monique afterwards. And also you'll be hearing about a number of resources from, um, from Warren and from myself, and we will be sharing those afterwards, uh, after this conversation, but also we'll make them available to everyone to, to get hold of. So um, I think now if uh, I just hand over and we can get into the conversation and hear more from Warren. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Warren Smith, who's joining us from the UK government. He is the director of the Global Digital Marketplace in the Government Digital Service there. Hello, Warren. Hello. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And I wonder if you could just give us um, a little bit of an introduction and background on the Government Digital Service, the organization you work for, and some of the work that you're doing. Yes, uh, thank you, Carrie. And it's a pleasure to, to join you today. Um, so I'm the, as you said, the Director for the Global Digital Marketplace Program. Um, the UK Government Digital Service uh, is responsible for digital transformation of government, um, and we help uh, people to interact with the government and support the government to operate more efficiently and effectively. Uh, this includes a number of areas, uh, including uh, commercial reform in digital, and also to support the market to gain access to the government market as well. Uh, my work specifically in the last uh, two to three years has focused on working with overseas governments to help them to open up their public procurement processes also. Okay, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of interesting topics that we're going to cover here then today and some uh, interesting intersectionality. Um, so, as you know, we're here to talk about the power of open source and government digital transformation. And if we reflect on um, some of the things you've just mentioned and um, GDS, Government Digital Service in the UK, um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of guidance that you give on buying and on building technology. And one of the, um, that's a little bit a key principle or, or tenet, which is about be open and use open source. And I'd just like to ask you a little bit, um, so why, why is that? And also, how is it that you go about getting um, departments from around, around government and also the suppliers to buy into that and to actually deliver on a promise like that? It's a uh, yeah, good question. I think this goes back to um, the government design principles uh, that were published right at the beginning of, of GDS. And uh, I think it's principle 10, which is about make things open. It makes things better. Uh, and this was a really underlying uh, principle for how we help to make government more open um, and also to the point uh, that I'm, I made around uh, the GDS uh, role around uh, making sure that government works effectively and efficiently for uh, for citizens and businesses. Um, I think 
the the point around uh, make things open, it makes things better, is to ensure that uh, we are continuously looking to improve what we do. And so by making things open, it, it allows others to contribute to what we're doing. It also allows others to um, build on what we're doing and also to uh, improve where we, uh, what we're doing um, very broadly. And that really applies not only to technology, but also to um, uh, ways of working, uh, standards that drive the, the quality of delivery um, and also the culture of what we're doing. So um, we often talk about open in a very broad sense in terms of open source, obviously very relevant to today's session, but open data, open standards and, and open markets and how uh, these aspects together really support and contribute to uh, making government work better for, um, for citizens and businesses. And I think that's um, that's very interesting. Some of the other areas of working in open ways um, sort of ties all of this together. I think we'll probably um, dig into that a little more actually in, in just a moment. If we continue on that vein on open source and using um, and using that, I guess it's quite interesting to understand um, some of those benefits that governments get from um, from open source technology uh, around um, savings and efficiencies. Can you give any examples, um, you know, from your experience, whether it's um, working within the UK government or some of the other engagements that you're on, where you see these benefits of either reuse or uh, time, money, you know, tell us a bit about those. Sure, um, and I think this really goes to the heart of, of the uh, efficiency and effectiveness side of things, because um, we see across um, the public sector, central government, local government um, uh, and other organisations that they're often trying to address um, common problems and challenges um, and so it's pointless um, and extremely uh, ineffective and costly to keep repeating and reinventing the wheel each time by and so by making uh, technologies or uh, digital services or other aspects open and reusable it means that others around the public sector and not just within one country but across the world can benefit from the fact that somebody's already done something to to a standard which requires um ins you know ensuring that it meets user needs it's um it can be reused and so that the opportunity to um to accelerate digital transformation of government becomes even even greater when it means you're not just repeating and reinventing the wheel each time. So we've seen uh, a, a number of examples of that um, uh, from a, a like a government as a platform perspective. So Digital Marketplace, for example, um, uh, in 2016 helped the Australian Digital Transformation Agency to uh, release their public beta of, of of their digital marketplace in just um, five weeks, I think it was. Um, Gov.uk Notify has been reused in countless uh, uh, countries as well, but also some of the underlying building blocks of digital services like the uh, Gov.uk design system. So um, it really uh, it really extends to um, pretty much every aspect of government where those approaches of open and reusability are being applied to the very fabric and building blocks of government. Um, we've seen it also in, in uh, commercial uh, terms, in terms of the um the uh, contracts that govern public spending so we've done some uh, work in the uk which then led to us being able to to kind of export uh, some of those um, components and approaches to support other governments around the world so really i would i would challenge anybody who says that the uh, the, the spirit or the uh, principles of open cannot be applied to pretty much every part of government to support that transformation efforts I mean, you've just um, you've just given us some pretty groundbreaking and uh, um, <laughs> mind blowing examples there, and I'd I'd like to talk about a few of those and um, in detail and sort of expand on them for the for the audience who might not be as familiar with uh, with these. So you talked about the digital marketplace and Notify and design systems and contracts. I think it would be great. If we go through each one of these um, at a time, because they're they're brilliant examples. Um, so the digital marketplace. Could you uh, could you talk a little bit about the um, about what the what we're talking about with the UK digital marketplace? Because that's distinct from the the global digital marketplace role. So it's you know just good to explain what it is 
and how did that conversation come about with the Australian government and um, if you could just talk a little bit about um, you know what were what was it they were after and how how what were the benefits that they got um, from work that had happened uh, you know the other side of the world uh, by a completely different team with you'd have thought different policies uh, you know potentially completely different skills and capabilities in the first place yeah uh, of course and yeah, so um, taking each one of those, so the digital marketplace in the UK was um, launched in order to support a, a very different relationship between uh, the state and the private sector. Um, and so we wanted to open up the market to enable a more diverse range of, uh, of digital and technology um, service providers to gain access to the significant um, uh, market, which is uh, the UK's public procurement market. Um, in around the same time that GDS was uh, created, um, the the National Audit Office, which is our supreme audit institution in the UK, published quite a, I would say, a damning review of, uh, of the UK government's digital and technology landscape, uh, which looked back at 2009 and uh, estimated that the government was spending about 16 billion pounds a year on uh, on, on tech. 80% um, of that was with just uh, uh, 18 suppliers. <laughs> so we had a really concentrated market uh, dominated by um, generally large suppliers and those relationships were typically long-term contracts, very high value contracts, and really um, small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, didn't really have uh, a, an, an entry point into that market. So the digital marketplace was, was launched as a, as a response to that, uh, to that challenge. Um, and so since then, it's, uh, so just looking at, uh, back at 2020, we, we can see that we've been able to open up the market to thousands of, of uh, uh, SMEs uh, and actually spend through the digital marketplace with SMEs in 2020 exceeded a billion pounds. Um, total spend through the digital marketplace is, is approaching three billion a year. Um, so we've, we've made a, a very important start on market diversification and the approaches that we've taken to, to enable that is all about the same principles and, and approaches that we apply for digital service delivery. Focus on user needs, make things open, make things reusable, and simplify the process for the primary users in public procurement, which are the buyers, the people within government who are trying to uh, transform their digital public services and uh, introduce new technologies, as well as the suppliers. So making sure that we, we understand the, the needs, the challenges, and the pain points that they're experiencing and we design out that friction to enable a much more open and collaborative relationship between the state and the private sector. Um, so that success story, uh, is we're still on a journey but we, we've made some important um, uh, starts and laid some important foundations. So it, as I said it was back in 2016 that we were approached by the um, uh, the, the equivalent agency within the federal Australian government, the Digital Transformation Agency, Digital Transformation Agency, DTA, sorry, um, uh, who, who wanted to um, create their own digital marketplace. And uh, rather than, as I said at the, at the beginning, rather than just simply reinventing the wheel and starting from their own blank piece of paper, they said, well, we can see a great example in the UK. Um, Perhaps there's an opportunity to, to uh, learn from the UK, reuse the technology, reuse the experience uh, and lessons learned from the team. Um, and so that led to um, uh, a couple of members of the team spending a, a couple of weeks in Sydney, Australia, um, uh, with, with the code and with the know-how uh, and with the understanding of what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and like I said, it supported their uh, uh, publicly to launch in the autumn of that year and it just took uh, five weeks for that public beta to launch. So what, what that shows to me, and I think to anybody who, who I mean, five weeks, really? And it's, so the, the, the power of the reuse of not only the code, um, which is an important part, but also the, the sharing and the openness of the, the teams involved and the willingness to reuse rather than reinvent the wheel. And so that led to a, a, a five week implementation Think how much money has been saved through that uh, approach. So that's benefiting, obviously, the um, uh, 
uh, the taxpayers in, in, in Australia, but also we get a great use case in the UK for that level of collaboration. And, and the, the partnership with Australia extends much more broadly than the, um, the digital marketplace, including things like the, ser the digital service standard and, and other aspects which relate to digital uh, government transformation. So there's a really nice story there about how all the different parts and the components uh, and um, uh, kind of attributes of what digital government looks like, which uh, all all fit together really nicely. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, did I miss anything from your your question there? Uh, no, not at all. And I think, um, well, firstly, in the spirit of being open, you know, that was when we worked together, and I was part of that, and you know, saw the value. I saw the value of it firsthand, um, and was astonished by the speed in which someone could do something so quickly which had taken you know a good deal of skill and time and um lessons learned from you know from our from our own government and team so um the figures the figures you're talking about are pretty staggering in the first place you know you're talking about uh 16 billion pound industry and like shifting uh so you know a whole economic change in terms of bringing about you know, a, a new market for small and medium businesses and the growth there. Um, it's really interesting to see that that can come about and even have a knock on international effect um, from, from open source and these open ways of working. And I'll, I'd like to come back actually on um, some, of the, some of the other really fascinating things you've brought up again with Australia, that it was um, more, than, more even than just the platform and how you've also collaborated um, with Australia. But it'd be very nice to kind of just move through to um, to gov.uk notify and if you could just talk a bit about the platform and just sort of to give some um, background uh, some basic statistics on it the, the platform itself I know um, is used by ni over 990 organizations in in the UK uh, and is responsible for you know messaging hundreds of thousands of messages uh, each day as well so could you tell us a bit about what notify us for how it works and again that you know it's it's a it is an incredible sort of showcase of reuse from its initial purpose as well as how it's suddenly you know sort of actually been taken on board by by other governments even yeah absolutely it's a it's a, another um i would say kind of poster child for gds um uh, UK notify among others like uh, UK pay and, and PAS um, and so yeah the the UK notify was established uh, as a, uh, a a common government platform to address a recurring um, need uh, that uh, many many digital services or teams across government need to address in terms of keeping um, users uh, notified, hence the name, <laughs> of uh, kind of well, any number of aspects in relation to the, uh, their interaction with government. So uh, that might be um, knowing the progress of a particular uh, application for something or, um, or, or whatever, but the, the point being that it's, there's no need to have um, various different solutions to uh, notifying different users when um, when it's a common uh, common challenge or a common need, so let's create uh, create a, a reusable platform once, create it well based on um, the exacting standards of uh, of the service standard, and make it reusable. So Notify um, can uh, keep users um, updated either by uh, text, SMS, by email, or even by the written letter, um, because uh, we need to make sure that uh, these services cover all users and not not just ones who might be digitally um, connected um, and so that's uh, i don't have the stats to hand i'm really sorry but uh, i think it all it is all in the public domain so uh, i would encourage anybody um, who's listening to this to to have a good look at the um uh, the uh, notify platform on gov uk and also the, the the gds blogs around that as well um but the the point there that you can you can see across not not only central government but um, local government as well, the need to keep users um, updated on uh, on any aspect of a, of a transaction or an interaction. This massively ramped up um, as a result of the COVID-19 um, pandemic 
uh, and we saw a huge surge in, in usage, but also not only um, in terms of volume of notifications, but also use of the platform itself to really uh, help those people who, who needed it, particularly things like the uh, people, vulnerable people um, uh, who are most affected during this particular uh, crisis. So yeah, it's a great example. Um, and we've seen that being replicated um, in many other jurisdictions around the world. So I think Canada, um, uh, Australia as well, uh, as well as uh, as well as others as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a great example. But there are many. There are others. Yeah, um, and I think one of the really um, fascinating parts here as well was that in um, in Canada, not only did they take notify, but then again, it's about um, building on something because they've implemented multi time zones, multi language. So you know. That's again, it's the, the fact that you can build on and collaborate and continue to evolve things, um, even with sort of what you might think would be you know, diverse. Actually, there's a lot of commonality across um, across different different nations, different departments even. So, yeah, thank you. Um, design systems. Um, you mentioned the design system. And I think, you know, again, we, we often think about, you know, we've been talking about these quite sort of large platforms um, and solutions uh, for reuse, which have, you know, had massive uh, impact and savings. But I think, you know, if we're going to think about something that's really um, sort of uh, made probably one of the most important uh, impacts and is uh, reused <laughs> to an immense extent uh, it's design systems and we see these around the world it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about what they are um, the UK's specific one and also uh, what's happening around the world that um, with the uh, work you've been doing as well Sure. Uh, and so, first of all, I should say full disclosure that I'm not a designer by <laughs> by, by profession or, or anything. I I am a a, a recovering procurement professional, but <laughs> what I am very um, passionate about is applying um, design-led approaches to um, to reform public procurement. And so, um, so anything that I'm I talk about when I'm referring to the design system, I think it shows and it's kind of back to that point I made at the beginning that there's really no part of government that um, that can't be improved by taking that open user-centered design-led approach and we've we um, in the UK and also in terms of our overseas work we've really been bringing that into how that can support uh, commercial reform and, and, and simplification of public procurement as well. So ultimately, um, my my understanding and experience of the design system in the UK is around, um, again, the points about uh, doing something once and well and making it reusable so that others, um, digital teams, service teams around the public sector, aren't starting from a blank piece of paper and repeating <clears throat> repeating uh, tasks or um, uh, design challenges that have already been solved by a dedicated team who are relentlessly and continuously um, improving that underlying building block of any digital service within government. So that could include things like uh, the styles that are used, um, uh, <clears throat> the the sort of the ways that the user interacts with the systems. That might be you know. <laughs> So, you know, these might seem like simple things, but the uh, sort of check boxes or radio buttons or start pages or anything that is that is the the uh, the, the interface between the user and the digital service. Um, these all follow the um, the the design system and the the components and the styles and the, the aspects that make up that um, uh, that particular uh, that particular thing. And so um, you can see when uh, even if the um, even if the front end looks somewhat different, you can see the consistent and common aspects that that have the design system behind it. So it's not it's not like a straight jacket or a uh, or or a you know um, a diktat about how it should look. It's about the kind of the interaction elements as well. Um, but certainly from um, the expectations around uh, anything that sits on gov.uk, it should be using that. Um, uh, underlying uh, component to ensure a consistent user experience is 
uh, is, is uh, there for the users, for the citizens, for the businesses. Um, I think I've seen some really interesting examples of reuse of that, again, kind of relating to um, the COVID-19 pandemic where uh, service teams out of necessity had to spin up new services within days. Um, and so that the importance of having um, a, uh, I suppose, a, a toolkit of, uh, of building blocks at the disposal of those teams is really important when it when it can actually be a you know a matter of life and death in in, in this current situation. So um, uh, that's that's really important around not only the the quality of what it, what they represent, but also the availability as well. And so yeah, imagine if those things weren't there and the, the teams that had to respond um, to the pandemic had to start from a blank piece of paper, then you know that that could have led to perhaps some dire consequences. Um, we've seen that the design system being reused elsewhere around the world as well. Um, and you know, you, as I said, you, you can see the characteristics when that has been done, even though the, the, the front end might um, uh, appear somewhat different. Um, and also, I, I mean, I've mentioned around um, uh, procurement and commercial, that you can apply the same um, aspects to elements of interaction between buyers and suppliers when developing requests for proposals or responding to requests for proposals, signing contracts uh, or counter-signing contracts. We've seen some great examples of that through the digital marketplace in the UK. So really, uh, as I said, I would, I would challenge anybody uh, to find an area of government that cannot be improved by taking that, uh, that approach and reusing those kind of building blocks uh, in, in the process. And sorry, um, you're, 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 and then your your final point of the question. Um, so we've been working um, in a number of countries um, around the world, uh, in Latin America, uh, Southern Africa, and Southeast Asia, um, with uh, to to bring these um, these aspects into our conversations with um, stakeholders uh, in those countries to help them. Um, to uh, establish their own approaches. Uh, we're not by, by no means ever um, uh, saying that this is what you must do. But we're, we use that to tell the story about what's worked and what hasn't worked in the UK um, and, and then uh, using that to inform the discussions about how we could collaborate together, understanding, and this is very important, the, the, the contextual factors of, a, of the governments and the countries uh, and the challenges that they are working to address, and also their own um, domestic priorities as well. Uh, so, for example, in Southeast Asia, we've been working with the uh, the Jabbar Digital Service, uh, which is part of the West Java Provincial Government in Indonesia. Um, and we've been helping them to establish their own service standard to assure um, and, uh, and ensure um, high quality digital service delivery. Um, and the, obviously the starting point for that conversation for us has been the UK service standard. And, uh, but we've, we've now effectively handed that over to the team who are completely capable uh, of, of, of taking this to the next level themselves. And we were really excited by uh, seeing how they then um, develop that and continuously improve that for their, for their, for their, um, for their domestic efforts. Um, another example in, uh, in Penang, uh, in uh, Malaysia, we've been helping them to develop their own uh, user research standards. Uh, and again, obviously, the, the starting point for that conversation has been uh, what we've been able to do in the UK and what we've also seen that being replicated uh, elsewhere uh, around the world as well. And also in Penang, Penang State, um, with, so it's actually uh, Digital Penang. Um, is helping them to establish guidance for vendors around um, APIs and data sharing. So uh, again, we've got a, a plethora of information and experience available to support that. Um, and actually, in doing our own uh, user research with um, uh, Penang Digital uh, and uh, uh, Jabbar Digital Service, we've uh, unearthed some interesting insights from applying uh, those those uh, approaches to, in, in another government context, which we've then been able to feed back to the teams in the UK to support their own thinking about how that improves. So that's a virtuous circle. And, and again, it's like the importance and the value of, uh, of an open approach, which enables everybody to benefit and learn from and continuously improve from 
uh, those things being open and applied to other contexts uh, that perhaps weren't anticipated at the, from the outset. So uh, really excited by that work. Um, and there are other examples um, uh, in, in around the world. Like Mexico, for example, we've been working with their um, uh, on the, the team who are responsible for their national digital platform, helping them to uh, establish uh, APIs to enable data to be shared between different systems at the national and also the state level um, to uh, support their um, national anti-corruption system secretariat as well. So yeah, it's really, really exciting work that's been taking place. Uh, and what, what, so it's not just about the technology, there's a really important piece around the, the passion uh, and the, the willingness uh, and the, the skill sets of the, the people involved. So. Uh, we've been focusing very heavily on on helping to to build digital um, capability and capacity as we go through uh, all these projects and uh, and also that culture of, of um, openness and uh, collaboration and, and sharing and reuse. So many different avenues I want to spin off to now. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm going to point out a few of the different things and I think let's see how many we can pick up in the time that we've got. Um, so some of the things you talked about on the design system, um, which I thought um, uh, in terms of having the, the quality, uh, I think there's a, a really uh, critical area here around um, inclusion and accessibility as well. And I think that that's a thread that's coming through a lot of the topics that you've been talking around. So. The design system which has these open source components that a front-end developer could reuse and there's also a number of other kind of standards built in but you know this is also it's like it's it's ready made with all of you know with this there to help society and i wonder if you could talk a bit about um inclusion and accessibility and I, i'm starting with the design system as sort of an open source example but i think it also goes through a number of the topics that you're talking about and then after that, I think there's um, certainly interested in talking about how you said, you know, there's the suppliers and partners are also building on these different elements. This isn't something that has to be done just within government by government, um, which then flows also around the conversation you're talking around with skills and capabilities um, and, and culture. But if we could just start with the um, starting with inclusion, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm glad you you brought that up because it it's fundam absolutely fundamental, um, and you could see how because the design system and and any digital service or um, or product that's built using that is effectively accessible, um, you know, has accessibility embedded in it, right? So so um, in order to support the requirements for ensuring. Uh, inclusive, accessible um, uh, digital services and technologies, then that that helps to massively accelerate that across the public sector. So, um, yeah, ensuring that the the underlying building blocks are accessible in themselves, then uh, should flow up into the um, uh, into the kind of higher order systems within uh, those value chains as uh, as. Uh, teams around the public sector are reusing those things, um, and it's not so. While the, the accessibility of um, of digital services and technologies is, is a massively important part, and uh, I would also encourage any uh, any uh, any of the audience listening to this to to have a look at um, uh, the guidelines and some of the the uh, blog posts that GDS has been publishing around this. Um, there's also a massively important part around um, how we ensure that government is serving uh, the society and the representation of society uh, across all of its activities. So we see, um, if, if I could just bring that back to, into the kind of the commercial <laughs> procurement side of things, it's uh, we know that the um, uh, like SMEs are, are often referred to as the backbone of the economy, right? And that's not just the UK, that's across the world. And so if, if we see that there is a, um, uh, an approach being taken in terms of procurement and commercial that doesn't reflect that uh, that landscape of of, um, uh, of private sector or not just private sector actually it could be um, so uh, social enterprises charities voluntary organisations who all make up the the, the supply ecosystem of uh, public service delivery if our commercial approaches aren't reflecting that diversity then 
somebody somewhere has got to be saying, hold on a minute, perhaps there's something we're not quite doing right here, or we're, we're not, we don't understand the, the diversity, we're not, uh, we're not doing everything we can to lower the barriers to participation um, in, in terms of our commercial approaches. And that's why I think the digital marketplace in the UK is a great example of that, where we have opened up the market to thousands uh, uh, of, uh, of SMEs. Um, and it's not, you know, the, 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 the larger players are still in the mix, of course, and, we, and it is about a mixed economy, um, but making sure that we have access to that uh, diverse economy to show that we are being inclusive and it represents the the um, the society uh, that uh, the government is there to serve it is hugely important to ensure that um, any um, public spending is then obviously being distributed to as wide an audience as possible um, and I think um, social value is a hugely important part in terms of design uh, of commercial approaches which enables access um, should enable access to that uh, as well and um, we've seen uh, yeah as I said digital marketplace great example of that and uh, uh, that in itself provides almost a design pattern which could be reused for other uh, other areas of expenditure outside of digital uh, where the economy um, of supply is uh, broad diverse ever-changing um, and we want to be able to ensure that government's procurement activity can support uh, that diversification can support the stimulation of the economy from a supply perspective and governments are often um, the, the, some of the largest uh, spenders on uh, digital and technology so have, they have a, a vital role to play in ensuring that that diversity and inclusion uh, extends into their um, commercial undertakings and actually not only commercial but pre-commercial um, so we've seen some really great examples where uh, research and development investment can be channeled through to gain access to the uh, the entrepreneurial market, the innovation ecosystem, if you like. Um, and so, particularly when there are um, public sector challenges that might be perhaps unique or so, yeah, somewhat unique to the to the public sector. And so, um, how do we ensure that we're opening up the market to the entrepreneurs to to bring them in to help solve some of these um, public sector challenges and uh, there's various mechanisms that we've done in the UK to uh, to do that and so these approaches are consistent in terms of you understanding the problem space understanding the outcome you're trying to achieve the impact you're trying to have uh, and the needs that aren't currently being met and making sure that you bring together a a, a diverse a range of stakeholders and providers um, to address those challenges so uh, that's uh, it's really great to see it, that those approaches that we've seen to be successful in commercial can equally apply to uh, innovation and research and development and pre-commercial procurement as well uh, so again yeah that's massively important that inclusion diversity um, uh, equity and equality are fundamental um, uh, characteristics of, of any approach that you take and um, i think this brings us back again to um to that uh, the technology code of practice um, point, which is the be open and and use open source, um, and also about using open standards. And I think these are quite complementary and potentially um, maybe it, they might be confused like anyone that this is new to. So um, we just explore just a bit like when we're talking about using open source, open standards um and working in the open just sort of differentiate between them but maybe also talk about how it's um it, how it's an ecosystem uh would be would be good yeah um and and thank you for anchoring it to the technology code of practice <laughs> which is our which are a, a fundamental um set of criteria that, that the uk government uses to assure plans for either uh, buying, um, building, reusing, uh, et cetera, digital services or technologies um, before the uh, activity takes place. And so um, point, uh, point three within the technology code of practice relates to um, being open and, and using open source. Uh, and that, that covers um, the differences between open source and open standards. Uh, and so it talks about open source being a way of developing and distributing software. And the code is often 
uh, written collaboratively and it can be downloaded, used and changed uh, by anyone. Open standards are common rules that allow any user to create compatible and consistent products, processes and services and uh, they're designed collaboratively, uh, are publicly available and also free or low cost. So um, the, the, the guidance around uh, meeting point three covers this distinction as well as uh, further factors for how uh, we talk about kind of giving open source a, a, a level playing field alongside other uh, other solutions. And so there's there's various points in there which helps um, digital and technology teams within government to understand what they should be thinking about, what they should be doing, and also things to be keeping their mind open to in terms of um, uh, costs associated, because sometimes people assume that open source uh, software is completely free, whereas that might not be the case. And so it's important to take into account um, the total cost uh, um, and whole life cost of, of any uh, technologies in, in thinking about what they're going to do. So that could include the cost of migration, um, exit and transition costs, um, support, for example. Um, so yeah, that's it's important that in any of the points within the tech code of practice that there's clear, um, clear guidance to help people make the right decisions. Um, and also, to ensure that uh, the the, uh, the approaches that are taken uh, are adaptable, can scale, um, and can be shared as well. So that's a really important kind of overarching points around technology code of practice. Um, fundamentally, uh, and this is a kind of golden thread throughout all of the approaches we take. It's, it's all about meeting, uh, understanding, and meeting user needs, and allowing for technology to not um, uh, create a kind of a lock-in either from the technical or commercial perspective but ensuring that there is the flexibility and adaptability and ultimately achieves um, social value for money uh, in, that, in those decision makings. Um, if I can just also just link the um, point three in the technology code of practice which is at the pre-procurement planning stage through to um, point 12 in the service standard which is at the post-procurement service delivery and implementation stage and uh, point 12 in the service standards is it requires uh, service teams to make new source code open and so this talks about uh, making it open and reusable and publishing it under appropriate licenses and, uh, or if this isn't isn't possible providing a convincing explanation of why this can't be done for a specific subset of the source code so what these standards provide a really important um I, I, I often refer to them as bookends for public procurement because if if at the planning stage you, you're set, you're um, you're setting out to obviously give a give that level playing field to open source that that um, those approaches should flow into your procurement design your your evaluation your contract award and then into the service delivery stage so you're thinking about these uh, approaches and principles and standards throughout the whole life cycle of public spending thinking of it holistically rather than kind of in siloed stages that don't um don't kind of talk to each other so to speak so um the relationship the 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 uh symbiotic relationship between the planning stage and the tech code of practice and the service standard at the um uh, delivery assurance stage gives the ability to kind of connect those two things you anticipated this at the planning stage, this is what you're doing at the service delivery stage. And through the service standard and the assurance process, we, we assure that delivery incrementally through different stages, discovery, alpha, beta, and live. And so point 12 and point three are inextricably linked in, in that respect and provide that golden thread uh, throughout the whole the sort of holistic life cycle of public spending. And so I think you're highlighting that in order to um be to successfully um, use open source and open standards there's quite a lot of other elements you need to put in place and you've been naming some of the ones in um, particular that you have in the UK with the technology code of practice and service standard and uh, design principles as a whole sort of set of different um, areas I wonder um, is it, how, how do you how do you ensure that these uh, these are go from just guidance to practice. Is it is there a mandate? Uh, how you know it's one thing to sort of publish good practice; it's another to make sure that it happens. So, what do you do in the UK? And also, as you said, you've been working with other governments on exactly this aspect. Um, 
where do you where do you take those conversations and what do you see happening what where's the momentum with uh you know with this going yeah it's a great question and um what we've seen uh, well what we do in the uk and what we've um seen to be important in other uh, jurisdictions and and the areas of interest is is the is the relationship between the standards and the guidance i.e the kind of you know how you do this and then it's the governance and the assurance that goes with it so uh, the team in gds who are responsible for that uh, provide the uh, the assurance or the sort of challenge function and that's a, a constructive challenge function to enable um, delivery teams who are responsible for their own budgets and their own delivery um, uh, and their own kind of you know, policy areas and priorities to um, embrace and live through and work through the, the, the standards. But that assurance function is really fundamental to ensure that the standards are embraced, embodied, um, and ultimately um, uh, lead to better service delivery, better social value for money. So it's that, it's the, yeah, it's the it's the, the challenge function, the spend controls at the pre-procurement planning stage and the delivery assurance at the post-procurement uh, implementation stage. And those, that, that, that role is absolutely critical um, to uh, ensuring that the, um, the change happens, the transformation happens. Um, and I know that there was a, a, a publication recently from, um, in fact, this month from Open UK, which um, recognizes uh, the UK's kind of leadership in this, area um, and it talks about the importance of spend controls as a as a cornerstone of that digital government transformation and uh, helping to br uh, bring in open standards and open source to support that uh, so I would, I would encourage um, anybody to <laughs> have a look at that uh, it was fresh freshly um, published this month um, it's, uh, uh, it's the first report in a series of three uh, from open UK yeah so just to, just to summarize it's the standards and the guidance which have to be clear uh, and ensure that those standards um, ultimately deliver on the government transformation um, strategies uh, and plans but also it's the the challenge and the assurance and the governance function that goes hand in hand with those uh, with those standards okay and um i think for anyone who's uh in a position who's buying technology and is going to be applying those um, those different standards um, and go through uh, the, the the assurance. Um, I wonder um, it'd be really interesting from your perspective. Like, what are the kind of choices that um, that someone in government uh, should be making around? Say, you know, do you do you build or or do you buy? Um, and then, you know, how the decision points you said, you know, um, whether there's proprietary or open source solution, that there can be a case for, um, for proprietary solutions. And in either decision, then um, what would be the important questions for choosing technology and, uh, and a preferred open source solution? Yeah, uh, very, very good uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I quite often talk about um, the, the need to kind of move away from thinking about binary choices in um, in digital and technology I mean build and buy are, are kind of traditionally the, the the binary choices but there's a, a more more of a spectrum of choices that relate to that and so it's not it's, it's rarely is it 100% build or 100% buy it's a it's a kind of a mixed economy of, of those uh, approaches, but also, uh, and this comes back to our points around um, reuse, that because um, there are, uh, there will be um, other parts of government who've been able to develop um, solutions to um, uh, commonly recurring challenges, then governments uh, or public sector organizations should be you know, looking around and horizon scanning to see what others have been doing, how they've been able to approach those um, those challenges, and looking for those opportunities to reuse um, uh, open source elements within their kind of design uh, and planning for what they're going to do. Um, and so, because that's a, an integral uh, assessment criteria uh, of the tech code of practice, then teams within the UK government 
are required to, to um, describe how they've looked at uh, you know, reusing other, other aspects from around the public sector. And equally, it's required to show how they're, um, how they're uh, doing that at the service implementation stage. So reuse is another dimension within that decision making. But also consume uh, when, when it comes to things like data. So where other departments or, or other teams might be producing um, uh, data in a structured, um, uh, reusable, uh, shareable way using APIs, then that data uh, infrastructure becomes a really important part of thinking about digital service delivery and also how uh, uh, a, a particular team can then look at consuming that data to support their own uh, digital service. So, um, so that you're not just creating duplicated data sets across uh, across government in you know often inconsistent forms or perhaps uh, un, you know not not truly open or machine readable and, and so yeah that's a really important part as well uh, and there's uh, almost certainly other aspects as well so the, the data sources for example could be um, external to government um, equally there might be the technologies as well so yeah I think that that kind of binary build or buy uh, and even actually on the build, you know, you, you might be buying in some services or capabilities to support you to build um, uh, in in the first place. So yeah, it's uh, that's important to be really thinking about how do we how do we avoid um, any uh, reinventing of the wheels um, in any of our kind of planning and uh, procuring and delivery of uh, of uh, digital technologies uh, in government. So. Yeah, that kind of we we talk about in the in GDS kind of looking sideways a lot. So uh, you know, it's uh, really leaves no stone unturned when you're doing your your investigative horizon scanning and keeping an eye on on what others are doing because there's really great examples across the public sectors, UK and globally, uh, of people doing really great stuff. Um, uh, powered by open approaches, um, open source or open standards. Uh, so yeah, we shouldn't be looking to reinvent the world. I think um, I definitely had echoes of past lives in public sector. Um, some of the things you just said there, including with the data side. Um, and uh, you know, in AWS, we launched Open Government Solutions last year, and it's um, we hope it's a valuable resource to help with that horizon scanning. It's showing what other governments have done, so open source solutions, but also some of these other areas around working in the open um, and I think you know it, it's part of the journey uh, but where else for example um, w where else can governments turn for uh, for their for this sort of horizon scanning because it's one thing to to be looking not to replicate and not to reuse and certainly as you know someone who's supporting these efforts you know finding finding what has been done around the world is quite another thing so what kind of um what are the challenges for doing that and also i guess how um how do you see that being managed from um from within the teams that you're familiar with yeah um well certainly any any public sector organization in any country who have embraced kind of working in the open which is a, a really important part of, of being open you know that's more about the kind of the culture and the sort of the, the mindset of being open and so you know they're, they're talking um, uh, continuously about the work they're doing that could be their uh, either you know, work that they've done and they want to showcase that work or um, things that they're planning on doing there's a great example gov.uk who uh, published their, um, their roadmap um, and updated their roadmap recently so you can see what they're planning on doing. I think that's an important part of also how to help open up the market as well. The, um, the importance of being open at the planning stage and really being open to having constructive conversations with the market about uh, the opportunities for uh, partnering which will come in time through a, a future procurement is massively important to help a keep the market informed genuinely open up yourself to challenge and critique about the things you're thinking about you know whether or not you might have inadvertently um, introduced some technology bias or something into your into your thinking which uh, somebody externally might say well do you realize that um, this organization over there has already done something which looks like they, they've solved that problem so 
you should be looking to reuse that or here's so yeah that that open and constructive conversation is massively important and i've often talked about the the kind of combination between open data that's published at the pre-procurement stage which represents a pipeline of activity a, a you know, forward look of stuff that's going to happen combined with a truly open culture of talking about the problems that you're trying to address uh, the things you don't want to repeat <laughs> the things you don't want to you know uh, the things you the things you want to move away from that might be legacy either technology legacy or or legacy approaches and so really open being open and honest about the um the challenges you have the, the mistakes that have been made in the past and using that as a way to really encourage um, open deliberative participation with uh, not just the, the um the supply market but also civil society you know so i think there's a really important piece around co-design and bringing um uh, uh citizens businesses you know, users in their broadest sense uh into the the um the the uh planning stage and seeing how that can flow into the procurement and the um, post procurement implementation uh, stage as well um i think the um yeah, the importance of uh, using data in that kind of constructive way, not only is it about kind of opening up um, the kind of internal workings of government, but that which is important from a transparency perspective. Um, but yeah, I can really see how that is also a, a key part of helping to build trust between um, states and uh, civil society um so i'm not sure if i've answered your question caroline i'm really sorry but i just i went on a particular angle and uh, um so yeah do, you just remind me perhaps what the, yeah of... no, no, i was really enjoying it <laughs> we've gone we've definitely got explored another um another new area and, and it is in, i think it's great because we touched on so many different aspects uh having just started from looking at how open source uh is driving government transformation to you know corruption fraud inclusion uh civic engagement you know it's um like as i said you know the whole intersectional side is it, it, it's so broad um i guess if we go back we were talking about the um build or buy that it's not binary and you've been taking us on the journey so that the spectrum and i think the next part is to sort of talk about some of the decisions when you're choosing technology and um open source solutions or if you're choosing a proprietary uh, solution, what you know, what what decisions are being made at that point, um, and what are kind of the key things that should be kept in mind, whichever route you're taking? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. At, at, at the high level, um, and this this kind of the sort of overarching um, points of the tech code of practice in the UK, fundamentally it's all about introducing or updating technology so that it meets user needs um, and that's uh, a, a, a genuine understanding of user needs based on research uh, rather than kind of anecdote or assumptions um, we also need to make sure that the the decision making enables those technologies um, to be uh, shared across government so um, the reusability is a massively important part of that as well as open standards um, it's easy to maintain, uh, so we, we don't want to create inadvertently some, um, you know, uh, uh, overly large technical overhead for maintaining this um, this stuff as it's implemented. Um, it's also make sure it's scalable uh, for future use. So things change and things change uh, quite rapidly sometimes. So well, all the time, in fact, in technology terms. Um, so how do we make sure that what we're doing um, keeps keeps pace with that development and that through the horizon scanning we understand um, how things are evolving um, through a continuum towards uh, uh, greater commoditization or utility um, and also we we reduce the dependencies on single third-party suppliers um, and that's an important part of ensuring not only that we're we're minimizing um, technical or commercial lock-in but in doing so, we help to increase competition within that space. So that that is a, a, an underlying fundamental of um, uh, of you know, well functioning and transparent uh, markets as well. And ultimately, it all provides better 
uh, social value for money. And uh, the, uh, if I could just refer specifically to point 11 in the technology code of practice, which is all about defining uh, your purchasing strategy. Um, teams are required to show how um, they've considered commercial and technology aspects and contractual limitations together rather than being kind of technology and commercial being separate aspects. They're, they're interconnected inextricably. Um, and the, the guidance around uh, talks about um, the need for showing how user needs or problems are going to be solved or, or met. Um, how decision process for building or buying technology, back to your, your points about how they meet user needs and how it helps to solve or mitigate the problems. Um, and also, um, as I said, the, the kind of contractual limitations that there might be. But uh, social value for money is a, is a really important part of that um, uh, guidance, which relates to also our commercial function um, policy on social value, uh, which was updated recently. So. Um, the benefits of, of a purchasing strategy when considered in conjunction with um, uh, technology is that it helps to increase competitiveness and innovation. Um, it helps to uh, greater value from choosing to build or buy something, including the, the more broader aspects of, of consume um, uh, and, and reuse as well. There's longer term financial savings, uh, better negotiations. Um, and also, we 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 favour and have a, a you know, stated bias towards um, uh, disaggregation of contracts as well. So, uh, helping to kind of break up what traditionally was quite sort of monolithic um, uh, contracts covering pretty much everything, um, and also ensuring that there's a, a smooth transition of knowledge and, and capability um, throughout the contractual delivery, but certainly. Um, at the end of a contract or, or a program that we're, we've helped to build internal capability and capacity and knowledge uh, to ensure um, kind of, you know, sustainable um, change can happen within government. Um, and that also supports transition to uh, cloud commodity and common technology with favoring shorter, more manageable contracts um, as well. I'd like to pick up on the the last sort of sentence or two you were just, um, the points you were making there, um, particularly around that, uh, the capability and the differing contracts. Can countries at any level of development or um, digital maturity transformation make use of open source? And how does that align with capability or, or, or culture? Um, you know where do they stand yeah um it, it goes i think it goes back to um context is really key absolutely key in fact <laughs> it's uh so and this isn't about one size fits all there's a, it's a really important part of understanding the approaches that should be taken um areas to, f to focus on and prioritize based on the particular contextual challenges um constraints opportunities etc within um within the country but certainly a focus on investing in um capability and capacity teams um, and, and ensuring that there is a culture uh, of trust and empowerment of those teams to deliver um is absolutely fundamental um and so that kind of goes absolutely hand in hand with the standards and the governance that is required to ensure that things are done in the right way uh, for the right reasons and by the, the people who have the, the right skills and capabilities. So all of these things are interconnected. Um, and so uh, a, you know, a key part of the kind of assessment should be, right, well, what is the current level of capability? Um, and that can be down to a you know quite a granular level of, of a team within a department, within a within a, a ministry or within an organization and making sure that the approach is tailored to address that that kind of uh, specific uh, baselining but what that helps to do is obviously then give a give a, a roadmap um, for um, building that capability and capacity in a, in a structured sustainable way um, bringing in the private sector uh, or the the external market social enterprises charities etc um, to uh, work 
consistently to a common set of standards, which is effectively helps to establish what the shared understanding of what good looks like and what every, you know, that sort of helps set the, these are the this is the rules of the participation. So uh, we've, what we've done in the UK is make sure that the tech code of practice and the service standard uh, compliance with and support uh, to uh, to meet those standards are integral to the commercial agreements that are established through the digital marketplace. So that helps to, as I said, establish a common understanding of the of what we're all working towards. And so through that plan, you can start to bring in the capability, uh, build that capability and capacity in the uh, internal government teams. Um, and so, yeah, I think as just to summarise, um, these are all interconnected. Uh, uh, consider them together um, and have a plan which helps to, to build uh, capability and capacity um, through delivery. I think that's an important part, you know, kind of showing people how to do this stuff with real uh, real life examples. Um, uh, and often you've got quite a few examples of some of the, the really challenging areas of like legacy or, uh, or traditional approaches. Um, and yeah, grad gradually kind of reset the the balance and the relationship between um, public sector demand and uh, and the supply market. Thank you. Um, I think you know we've seen some of the um, some of the benefits, or maybe even like the necessity of open source during the pandemic when responsiveness and reuse has been critical to dealing with. Um, some um, emergency situations and you've mentioned a couple of those earlier um so you know as the momentum grows and you know more um around the world more public sector organizations governments are turning to are turning to open source and we've discussed uh, a myriad of different um areas around whether they're uh, policies the assurance processes uh, you know the different the code practice service standards you know, there's a lot of things that are in place, um, say, within the UK government. Um, what kind of support or where would you direct those who are now taking on board these approaches? What um, what advice, what resources would you direct them to to, to help them uh, carry on that journey? Yeah, good, good question. Um, uh, so obviously, I would say the GDS blog, but that's not, <laughs> not uh, that's not exclusively by any means. But certainly, that will give a sense of like our own journey. Um, the the multilateral organisations are uh, are working very hard in these uh, in these areas, and they bring together uh, governments from around the world as well. So like the OECD, the UN. Um, uh, specifically but not exclusively within the UN, the International Telecommunications Union, doing some great stuff, the ITU. Um, and so um, uh, GDS supports these organisations um, uh, on a number of working parties. Uh, we, we either lead them or we contribute to them. Um, and these are these, these tend to cover a number of different interrelated policy areas and challenges. Um, where digital is often uh, or, well, almost <laughs> exclusively seen as a, a cross-cutting enabling element for tackling uh, other areas like um, uh, corruption or, or uh, equality, uh, social exclusion, um, market diversification, SMEs, etc. So I would definitely uh, um, encourage any any government to participate where they where they can in those kind of uh, communities, those fora, um, the OECD, the UN, ITU, um, but also um, we in GDS, in the international team, uh, we have a, 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 a almost a continuous um, uh, calendar of, of, of uh, officials and other organizations from around the world who are interested in hearing from our own experiences. And, and also we are massively interested in hearing about their uh, experiences and, and uh, challenges and, and what they've been able to achieve and so we we can it's a you know it's not it's a two-way learning uh, experience uh, uh, from that respect so we would uh, very happily have a conversation with anybody who's interested um, and it's because a lot of these challenges are you know we can't they can't be addressed by any one entity or organization it's often a multi-stakeholder approach particularly when we think about the overarching um, 
challenges of the sustainable development goals and so they that provides a, a massively important uh, part of, of uh, well <laughs> or the the overarching framing for why are we doing what you know it's the so what right what what do we need to focus on that enables us to um to to uh, to to have a coordinated collaborative um and impactful approach which addresses some of the most fundamental challenges uh facing societies uh, around the world in the sustainable development goals and the pathway towards the 2030 agenda i think provides an excellent um, framing for that and really uh, yeah the overarching kind of approach uh, that we should be taking and of course um open government solutions is is a great kind of distilled compendium of of the practices that, that you've seen from around the world um, and of, of which obviously the uh, uk is a, a, a constituent part of that yeah, thank you. And obviously, there's some um, a lot of the different areas that, and examples we've discussed are, uh, are featured there because the the work that um, the UK government's done, amongst a number of other um, that we've uh, called on, are just great showcases. And you said the poster child of what can be achieved. So thank you for that, um, Warren. It has been. An absolute pleasure having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for for taking the time for uh, for sharing um, sharing all of the experiences and uh, work that you've been doing and insights. Um, it's been uh, I think we've we've definitely gone into broader territory than I expected when we started on the conversation about open source and digital transformation. So um, you know, I hope we I hope we get to continue the conversation again uh, later. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And yeah, I look forward to um, any further questions and uh, discussions on these on this massively important area. Thank you so much, Carolyn and Warren. That's really interesting. Um, before I invite Carolyn and Warren back on for the Q&A, you'll see um, there's a number of references. This is the gov.uk references um, that Karen, uh, Carolyn and Warren spoke about during the dialogue. Um, feel free, the slides will be made available um, with this recording after afterwards so feel free to click on the links to, um, to learn a lot more about open source and how it contributes to government digital transformation. Um, so I also wanted to remind the participants um, to submit questions using the Q&A tab on the right hand side. I see a lot of questions coming in so far but um, we'll try to get to get to all of them um, so if you can submit more questions um, that'll be great and um, here's also um, our email addresses, Warren, Carolyn, and myself. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, if we don't get to all your questions or if you want to learn a lot more or how we can kind of collaborate. So with that, I'd like to invite Carolyn and Warren back in. Hello. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Warren. Thank Hi. you so much for the very interesting dialogue. Um, so we've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to just dive in, um, dive in first on that to make sure that we can kind of cover as much as we can. Um, the first question that's coming in um, ask about, so of all the examples that um, the two of you had mentioned involve technologically developed countries, um, you did mention um, SMS and written letters for Notify, but how can these systems be adapted to work in low or no tech environments that may be more common across Southeast Asia, especially in areas with incomplete data infrastructure or even uneven access? It's a great question. Shall I go in on that first? So, yes, please do. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think a great question. And I think this comes back to a couple of points that we've already made around the importance of understanding who the losers are and what their needs are and some of the challenges that they may be facing in dealing uh, with or interacting with government. So context is absolutely critical uh, and not assuming that everybody has uh, the level of digital access that uh, you, you might assume at the beginning. So it's important that um, uh, services are inclusive and accessible uh, and uh, making these better for everybody. So it's important that government services work for everybody who needs to use them. Um, certainly in the UK, public sector organisations have a legal duty to consider everyone's needs when they're designing and delivering services. So we make this an essential part of our assessment criteria through things like the service standard when we are uh, assessing 
uh, digital services to make sure that they have considered uh, a, the broad range of users, those with digital access as well as those that don't have access. So, yeah, just to summarise, understanding users and, who, and, and their needs and being cl uh, clear and uh, respectful of the context in which those services are being provided. Great, thank you. And if I can, if I can yes, answer um, some of what Warren's just said, actually, I think um, this is really relevant in terms of the fact that to uh, to develop um, and to build obviously takes certain skills and capabilities. So that's always going to be one of the critical parts that um, that is needed for using open source. So I think um, to focus on making sure that you do develop those skills or find out where they're available from, because um, open source is reusable. So that also means that you can work with suppliers, with partners, if your organization doesn't have those skills and capabilities to do this. But even working with those partners means that they're able to reuse the open source uh, platforms, components that are out there, which again, still makes things faster um, and more affordable, both for you and for them. And you know, we see so many examples um, across Southeast Asia, I think open source, open source is running in our, in our phones, in our cars, in planes. It's, it's already prevalent around our entire environment. Um, and in terms of examples where we've seen it, you know, I mean, in, in India, 85% of their internet is pretty much running off um, open source software. And, um, you know, there are, there's uh, examples of open source digital identity being used across, uh, across Asia. And we also see uh, test and trace applications, for example, during the pandemic um, in Mauritius, there, there, there was the use of open source in order to make that happen very quickly. Um, and, you know, so we see a local government area in Japan around garbage collection issues, the reuse of applications there across different cities. So um, I think actually this is really a driver, a driver for change, an opportunity more for areas that are lower tech and no tech because um, because of that, uh, because it's already there and working um, and can then be picked up and reused rather than starting from scratch. Wonderful, that's uh, very fascinating um, how it's prevalent in everything. We, we don't even like think about it now. Um, I wanna get to, um, there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, there's a question about COVID-19. So why COVID-19 might finally usher in the area the era of healthcare based on a patient's data using digital technology. Do you want to take that first, Warren? Sure. Um, I think uh, the 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 um, the phrase "necessity is the mother of invention." I think is is really kind of central to uh, the innovation that we've seen, rapid innovation as a result of the the uh, the global health pandemic. And I think we've seen some fantastic examples where. Governments who have invested in their skills, their infrastructure and their technologies have been able to rapidly respond to um, this crisis by uh, bringing the best of what they can see in terms of um, data, but also the, um, the tooling that they've been able to gain, uh, that, they've, um, that they've got access to, to rapidly spin up new services in response to, to meeting the needs um, during this, these challenging times. So, so it's really kind of everything that we've spoken about so far in terms of the standards, the governance, um, the tooling, the technologies and the skill sets and the collaboration across not only the public sector, but also with other sectors who have a role to play in this. So uh, I think it's absolutely critical that it's enabled um, exactly this kind of thing to, to happen in the UK, we, with uh, an example being the uh, Extremely Vulnerable People Service, which is a a collaboration between um, GDS, the, the health service, uh, the local government, and also the private sector uh, in terms of supermarkets have all come together to ensure that people who are vulnerable and need to shield have got access to uh, and, and can have food delivered to them. So that was a, a great example of, uh, of exactly this kind of thing enabled through collaboration and the technology um, and the, uh, the underpinnings that we've invested in. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great question. Wonderful. There is a question in here um, directed to you, Carolyn. Um, can you share a little bit more about uh, the open government solutions and how can um, how can governments in this region leverage off of that? 
Yeah, so um, Open Government Solutions is um, it's a it's a collection of resources where effectively we're we're showcasing what other governments have already done. So um, I think the whole conversation we're having here anyway is about um, is about reuse and the opportunity to um, to solve shared problems and challenges. And when we when we look across governments uh, around the world whilst everyone does have their own unique factors and facets, there's so much commonality and such an opportunity where um, we, can, uh, we can take advantage of work that's been done by others and been successful. So, um, so Open Government Solutions basically took this, took this concept and we have built up what is a, a catalogue of open source solutions, but also uh, openly uh, reusable assets. So even whether they're policies around using open source or um, around design systems, around agile procurement, uh, as well as some of the platforms and the solutions we've been talking about. So these are, these are examples of, of what have happened around the world because the purpose is that um, if, if you're facing a problem, then it's good to see who's already solved that. Is there an opportunity to take advantage of that work? So we're pointing towards those. And obviously, as we continue, we, we, look, to, we look to understand what the, what the new challenges are, what the unique, that you're facing. So um, as we build up and explore those, then we'll continue to be building out that catalog and have wider representation. So of course, you know, it's also very important that we get the feedback um, to understand what we can do to evolve it um, and make sure that we're able to sort of put those examples uh, back in, in your hands and in the hands of other organizations that can also benefit from the work that, that you may have done in these areas. Can I just come in off the back of that? Because um, I think it's a really, it's a really fundamental <laughs> part of what we're talking about here that is it's it's not like um it's a continuum uh, a, a process of when once you make something open and you uh, are open to then hearing how that may or may not be working in other contexts i think there's there's a there's that you know ongoing continuous improvement aspect and we've got some really good examples where um the work that we've been doing in southeast asia for example the starting point of our conversations has been, well, well, here's what we've done with a service standard or a technology code of practice or a digital marketplace. But then we've been looking at how we need to think differently about the contextual challenges and needs of those other uh, governments and their stakeholders. And we've got some fantastic insights that we've then fed back to our teams in the UK to help them think about how they continue to improve their standards or their governance or their guidance. So, uh, a really couple of great examples, if I could just briefly mention them, is um, with uh, uh, Penang Digital. So, um, and the, they recently launched their um, Digital Transformation Master Plan, which is a fantastic uh, three-year uh, plan in, on the, as a stepping stone towards their Penang 2030 vision. Um, and it, it's things like that where we've been helping them uh, to develop standards and guidance around um, user research as well as APIs um, and data sharing. Um, and similarly with um, the Jabbar Digital Service in Indonesia, helping them establish their own service standards, um, which is the, the governance framework for digital service delivery within the West Java provincial government. So, uh, and we've got some fantastic, as I said, some great insights about um, how those uh, aspects that we've seen to be really successful in the UK don't necessarily immediately translate into another context. And so we, that's really important that we, are, we, we remain open-minded and flexible and adaptable to ensure that we're meeting those needs. Great, thank you. I love the idea of this continuum process. Um, there's a question around, you know, is, is there any code that we should not make open source? Yes. There's, so, I mean, there's always, um, there's kind of a spec, you know, I think we, we talked a little bit around the spectrum that, around the decisions you might make around whether you're buying open source or proprietary software, but there are definitely decisions where you would be, um, you would most certainly have uh, closed code. Um, and that would be, um, for example, if you have unreleased policy, because then obviously if, 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 you're, if you have open source code, which is referencing it, then it's publicly available to everyone. 
but also um, your key, you know, keys and credentials and algorithms that you might be using to, to detect fraud. Um, so those you would most certainly, um, most certainly want to keep close. That's not to say that you'd have um, all of your security enforcing code, that doesn't need to be closed, that can be open. But obviously those elements which, um, uh, which expose you, those aspects, those need to be closed. So make the decision between the two, they're, they're very different. One is, one is about giving away the key and the other is saying, hey, this is how a padlock works. We all know how a padlock works, so we can have that open, right? So that's kind of a paradigm there. Great, thank you. Um, so on top of that, there's another question that came in around, are there examples about open source policies where government agencies that want to undertake a software implementation um, is required to look at open source alternatives before they make a commercial selection? Uh, so in, in the UK, absolutely. That's a, a central part of our, um, uh, what we call spend controls. So. Um, at the at the pre procurement planning stage, uh, the um, uh, the investment stage, um, departmental teams are required to um, show how they've considered um, open source um, uh, solutions alongside others and given them a, a level um, playing field, so to speak, when they're considering what uh, technology choices they should be making. And there's there's really clear guidance that supports that particular point within um, our technology code of practice, point three, in fact, um, which uh, contains a number of questions uh, that should be asked in order to uh, make the right decisions about um, how to incorporate uh, open source software to, to deliver um, a better social value for money. So, um, and that's, uh, that, I know that's um, one of the things that have been included in the um, resource links uh, that you're kindly sharing. So I would certainly encourage anybody to have a look at the guidance around uh, point three, um, which covers um, all of those things as well. Great, thank you. Um, there's also a question about, you know, if, if I'm procuring a software from a vendor, can I require that the code that they write in is open source? That's uh, certainly something that we are uh, we're doing in the UK. Um, we require any, uh, as through the digital marketplace, any software that's developed um, uh, in response to the needs of government uh, should be made open under appropriate open source license so that others can uh, benefit and, and continue to improve that. So we've baked that uh, requirement into the contractual um, terms and conditions or the rules of the game, so to speak, for the digital marketplace so that we're being very clear to the market about what we expect um, and what they can expect from government as well. We're not we're not um, asking for any um, uh, exclusive rights to any of their background intellectual property, for, uh, but anything that they're developing uh, with us in response to our needs um, should be made available. And that's also assessed um, through the um, governance process as well. Great, and thank you. I can, I can add to that and say that you know, in, a, in a former role, in the cabinet office that was one of the tenders that we worked on um, and so the the partner that we ended up selecting we we worked together and uh and the race disparity order ethnicity facts and figures that was that's all made available um on github great thank you um conscious of time too there there's one question here also about um Many SMEs in Southeast Asia are not digitally connected or they are digitally connected at a very low level for a variety of reasons. Can something like Digital Marketplace adapt to that? For example, is there an opportunity for like a low tech version? It's a great question. And it, it's very, um, uh, very linked to the first question, in fact. And so yeah. the Digital Marketplace, like any other um, uh, digital service should be um, designed and delivered according to the standards that we require in terms of inclusion and accessibility. So absolutely. And I think so um, being uh, understanding where there might be the, the particular challenges in terms of um, digital connectivity or, or literacy is really important. But I think it's not exclusively the, the role of public procurement or um, uh, those other agencies within government could actually look to be helping to address some of those challenges. So there might be 
um, government organizations or other external organizations who are helping to increase the, the connectivity and the literacy of the private and, and other sectors so that they, they can um, uh, benefit from uh, the, the, the opportunities that digital and technology bring. So I think that's, that really does come into kind of, um, yeah, the multi-sector, uh, multi-stakeholder approach to help build digital skills. And also that has a, a knock-on effect, a positive effect for things like uh, employment, um, uh, security and resilience against uh, perhaps cyber threats as well. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's a kind of a, like a, a systemic view of how, um, how it's important to, to, to invest in skills and technologies to ensure that everybody's on a level playing field. Great, thank you. We are actually at time. Um, I do want to let everybody know, you know, thank you so much for joining us on this session. Um, uh, if there's any questions that kind of come up later, feel free um, with the slide deck, there will be our email addresses and ways to contact uh, any one of us. Um, this is a continuous um, kind of process. Um, please feel free to um, email any questions in afterwards to any one of us um, or give us feedback or ways that we can kind of collaborate. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody. Thank our speakers, Carolyn and Warren. It was very, very fascinating. Um, I've learned, I definitely have learned a lot too. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to Asian Development Bank for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much.